Okay, uh, I want to get into John 14, finish up John 14 and John 15. Now, John 14, I've been talking about how Christ is in the Father, right? The Son is in the Father and the Father is in the Son. And He is here to produce the many abodes. And the way He's going to do it is by going to death and resurrection. And in His death and resurrection, He's going to the Father and coming back to receive them to himself that where he is they may also be now that is is present tense where is he he's in the father and they've been following him their whole three years and uh now he tells them i'm going somewhere where you can't follow but don't worry i'm going to receive you to myself I'm going to bring you into the Father. I'm bringing you into a deeper realm. I got to cross the bridge. I got to be the ladder between heaven and earth. You can't go where I'm going. You can't ascend to heaven. Right? That's a. Uh, there's a psalm in Romans 10 talks about that. How who can, who's ascended to heaven? Only Him. Nobody can ascend to heaven except Christ. And that's where He's going. Where I go, you cannot follow. But don't let your heart be troubled. In my house, in my father's house, there are many abodes. So when I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come and, and receive you to myself that where I am, present tense, you may also be. And then they get into this big, kind of complicated conversation. Where are you going? To the Father. Well, show us the Father and it suffice to us. When you see me, you've seen the Father. Don't you know that I'm in my Father and my Father is in ye? Right? So, uh, then as he's continuing that conversation, he's explaining what he means. And he's saying, look, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Or I will not leave you comfortless. That word is orphans. I will not leave you comfortless. I believe it's orphans in another translation. In other words, I'm going to receive you. And when I come to you... You're not going to be orphans anymore. You're going to be sons of God. Why? Because I'm sending the Spirit. And the Spirit, we know from Galatians 4, 6, is the Spirit of the Son. Where he says, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And in Romans 8, we know that's the Spirit of Sonship. Uh, we have not received a spirit of bondage bring us into fear. But a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. So, it's the spirit of sonship that makes us sons of God. We are not sons of God only by adoption, but also by life. We're regenerated. This is what it means to be born again. The spirit of the Son has come into us. And regenerated our spirit and produced in our hearts... An understanding of who the Father is, because the Son is declaring the name of the Father in us, and who we are. On the one hand, that Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, right? And heirs. But the registration of that witness shows up in our heart through our mind. When our mind is set on the Spirit, and we agree with what God says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit, okay? But at the same time, the Spirit of the Son is in our hearts. And this is just a, a reminder to myself to teach about tripartite man. Sometimes, you know, I gotta get all the scriptures together. We need to see how man is made up. Uh, because that has to do with what God's building. What does it mean that he's building up... Uh, building making his home in your heart so it says in ephesians 3 right that christ may make his home in your heart through faith that word is abode to make an abode in you is the abode in the father's house same thing this is not talking about snatching you away to heaven this is talking about building the father's house and preparing a place for you in it and preparing you as a place for god Okay, now that is not to say that there's not a pre-tribulation rapture and all that. I'm just saying that the focus of this passage is not that. 
uh, you can use it for that if you want but if you stick the church in the new covenant to do it watch out uh, and I've been teaching on that lately so if you don't know what I'm talking about uh, check my messages about the new covenant the new covenant this idea that this scene is a marriage covenant with the church brings us it's a backdoor for legalism it's a backdoor for works and naivety okay so uh anyway he says then he talks about you know you're going to keep my sayings and i'm going to send forth the spirit if any man loves me he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him in my father's house there are many abodes where's the abode what's going to be with you okay it's as you keep my word i'm going to manifest myself to you how as spirit and life my words which i speak to you are spirit and life and that's practically how christ makes his home in our hearts on the one hand he's already in our spirit we're regenerated when we believe the gospel but as we continue in his word and we keep his words those words are christ himself that's john's emphasis is in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the word was manifested in the flesh tabernacled among us became flesh didn't just manifest in the flesh not like the gnostics say no he became flesh he put on flesh and blood he put on humanity he put on a nature like ours and expressed god in that nature sinless but human and even capable of weakness and suffering and loud tears and crying right but righteous spotless uh and now in resurrection he sends forth the spirit to manifest what he is as we keep his word and as that's going on he's making his home in our hearts by faith see he's already got this we've got the spirit of sonship we're no longer orphans the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god and heirs but galatians 4 says that he sent the spirit of the son into our hearts how is that that's when our heart agrees which it, which the leading part of the heart is the understanding which is the mind when we set our mind on the things of the spirit when we have the mind of christ we set our heart in agreement with the witness of the spirit and christ as the word makes his abode with us he's talking about dwelling with us now how does christ dwell with me how do i experience the spirit of sonship in my heart well i agree with god's word under the realization that this is christ himself the testimony of christ is christ the gospel is the power because it is christ it's the incorruptible seed what's the seed christ the seed of god the seed of david the word made flesh it's a person we're dealing with not just a doctrine although it's called a doctrine why is it called a doctrine because it's for our mind to understand but through our understanding and appreciation christ the person makes his home in our hearts and we experience the spirit of sonship in our hearts and this is our comfort i will not leave you comfortless i will come to you right comfortless orphans i think it's the same word but i like comfortless too because when the reason people go to the world system is because they're orphans and so they feel like they have to provide for themselves and they have to provide their own entertainment and provide their own wage and provide their own way of living and protecting themselves and out of that they build up a world system that actually ends up being in opposition to God because it's full of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All that comes out of orphandom, comfortlessness, okay? But when we receive the Father and the Son, 
he comforts us and he gives us a spirit of sonship and we as we learn to agree with him he makes his home in our heart as we if we love him we keep his words and my father will love him and we will come to him and make it our abode with him now you've got the son and the father you're not an orphan anymore you're a member of the household of god you are the house of god you are the real bethel he dwells with you and in you and that's why we don't love the world we don't need the world anymore we're not orphans we're not you know it's a, you can enjoy things in the world he's given us all things to enjoy you can be a musician you can go for walks you can watch tv okay that is not the same thing as loving the world to love the world means you are building your identity in the world because you're an orphan that's why it says if any man has not the love of the world the love of the or has the world, love of the world the love of the father is not in him once the love of the father and the son is in you he detaches you from the identity in the world to the degree that the spirit of sonship is in your heart and that's a matter of transformation and growth that's a matter of the father comforting you and casting out his perfect love casting out your fear because people build up the world system because they're slaves to the fear of death why are they slaves to the fear of death because they're orphans and they got no one to take care of them no one to shepherd them into everlasting life and the more we walk in the spirit and agree with him the more we taste the goodness of god and learn to rest in him the less we need the world and then there are things in the world that we enjoy but it's not a big deal because it's not based on all these sinful lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life you know and for some people their religion is their pride of life the religion is their world the religious systems in the world are just as much a part of the world as the rest of it in fact when paul said i'm crucified to the world and the world is to me he was talking about the religious world and staking your claim on identity based on your track record in religion we need to be delivered from that and the reason people are not delivered from that again is because they are not enjoying the spirit of sonship they're not enjoying the comforter they're not keeping his words and letting Christ be manifested to them and the father make his abode with them they still live like orphans clawing and clinging on to life and making a way for themselves they just found a space in the religious aspect of the world and it's still an opposition to God okay when Jesus talks about the world and when John talks about the world and even Paul talks about the world it ends up being the religious world of Cain because remember John said if you know if the world hates you don't be surprised they hated him and we are the sons of God but the world doesn't know it and he's pointing back to Cain Cain's a religious guy he brought an offering he thought he could be justified by works He's a works righteousness legalist, the first. So the world really is rooted in Cain, and it was out of Cain's line. After he departed from God and was an orphan, that the world system came about. It was his children that taught how to make weapons of war and musical instruments and built cities, while the descendants of Seth, Abel's replacement, all they did is live and multiply before God. There's no record of any mighty works of theirs. Why? Because their focus is not this world, it's life. They know that there's a city whose builder and maker is God, and they're resting in Him. So what we see is not a record of building and zealous work, but of resting and multiplication by life. And that's the difference between the world and the vine, which we're going to talk about in the next chapter. The vine speaks of the multiplication of Christ as life, as we rest and abide in Him. And in opposition to that is the world. And we'll see that again in John 15. The world hates us. Cain hates us. Orphans hate us. They are jealous of the spirit of sonship and the comfort we have. Okay? But he says, he that loves me not. Okay, so we're talking about building the house. Okay? It's our abode with Him not up in heaven but on in our life as we keep his sayings and he manifests himself to us uh, 
And he says, he that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Again, there's lots of people who talk about the love they have for God. And yet, it's clear that they're fighting against his word. You can't have it both ways. These things have I spoken to you while being present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He's sending him in my name. He's sending him as my representative. The Spirit is Christ's representative to us. Okay? Uh, he shall teach you all things. He's our teacher. He's our comforter. And he will bring to remembrance what I said. That one of the functions of the Spirit is to quicken the Word. And it's funny because, like, I'll turn on the mic and I have no idea what I'm going to say. And the Spirit just brings to remembrance all these scriptures. I wasn't talking about, planning on talking about the cane and the world and all these different things. That's the Spirit bringing to remembrance different things. But I had to get the Word in me first. It is by the keeping of the Word that the Spirit has a tool to work with. Right? And He comforts me through these words. All these words are comforting. You know, everything He ever quickens to me is a comforting word. Because he's here as a comforter and as Christ's representative to train me and to teach me that Christ is everything. He would teach me all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I said to you. Peace I leave to you, and I have peace. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. See, there's the world. Give, uh, in other words, how does the world give you peace? Well, you secure it. You fight for it. You purchase it. You work for it. But how does God give you your peace? As a gift. Christ made peace with us. By the blood. He is my peace with God. He's my peace offering. I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. Because of justification. Not because of anything I do. The world, your peace is based on, and security is based on what you can secure. Then you can rest, maybe. But it's a false peace. But in Christ, he makes us the sons of God by sending his spirit. This comforter, this representative of Christ, who begins to build the abode of God with us as we keep his word and as he brings it to remembrance and teaches us all things, what is he doing? He's actually manifesting Christ to us and he's manifesting the Father to us as love. So he says, peace I give you, not as the world gives give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, this is obviously not speaking of us in heaven. This is not talking about rapture and going to heaven. This is talking about there's a comforter coming who will keep your heart from being in fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. This comforter, this peace, uh, this spirit who the Father is sending in my name, I will not leave you comfortless. comfortless. I will come to you. Now I told you before it came to pass that when it comes to pass you might believe hereafter I will not talk with you much for the prince of this world has come and has nothing in me but the world may know that I love the father and the father gave me commandment even so I do what is he talking about well this is what the father commanded him that I give my life for the sheep and that he said the father loves me because I give my life for the sheep and this is his display of love for the father Christ's offering of himself was first and foremost a fragrance to God and a display of love for the Father. Not, for, not even it, you're not even in view. I mean, yes, you're in view in the sin offering, and in the uh, trespass offering, and the peace offering, and the meal offering. Those different aspects of the offering, but there's a deep aspect called the burnt offering, which is exclusively for God. And incidentally, if you hear somebody say that. The father turned his back on the son and they were separated in the death of Christ. That's heresy. No, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself in the death of Christ. He's never ceased to be the triune God. It's not the father over here and the son over there and the spirit over there. No, they're one. Believe me that I am in the father and the father in me and I in you and you in me. You won't be able to understand abiding in the Lord if you don't have a basic view of the triune God. But again, this is all talking about building the abode. And then, John 15 
is talking about living as the abode. Abide in me, and I in you. And that abode turns out to be a vine. It's still talking about the Father's house, built by the Son, not with hammer and tools, but by life and growth and multiplication. Uh, okay, so we've pretty much covered John 14. There's other things you could say, but uh, that's what I felt inspired to say today. Take care.